Greetings, everyone. My name is Yusuf Hashash. I'm the chair of the COGI committee, and uh, I am your webinar moderator. Uh, COGI is a standing committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. COGI was established as the focal point within the National Academies for government, industry, and academia on the technical and public policy issues related to earth processes and materials, soil and rock mechanics, responsible human development, and mitigation of natural and human hazards. If you have questions about COGI, please uh, contact Sam Maxino, National Academy's Staff Director of the Committee. This webinar is part of a quarterly webinar series produced by Kagi through the support of the National Science Foundation. The webinar will be posted on YouTube and an announcement will be sent out when it is available. Open your chats for messages from us and for speaker bios. We will have time for Q&A after the speaker gives his presentation. Audience can submit their questions anytime using the Q&A tab on the Zoom panel on their screens. We will pose as many questions as time permits. An important disclaimer, any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Ola Doyen Kolawalu, COGI member, is in the background and will be helping with your questions for our speaker. Samantha Maxino, Maya Frey, Sam Kraft, set up this webinar and Amici Okapabi is producing it. The seminar today, the topic is numerical modeling of large deformation problems in geotechnical engineering, challenges and opportunities using the material point method. Our speaker is Professor Pedro Arduino. He's a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Special Assistant to the Dean on infrastructure problems in the College of Engineering at the University of Washington. His primary research interest is in computational geomechanics with emphasis in constitutive modeling of soils, finite element analysis, meshless techniques, soil structure interaction, and hazard analysis. Much of his current research is in the area of landslide simulation and tsunami-driven debris effects on structures, so structure interaction, and linear wave propagation in geologic media, and performance-based earthquake engineering. Today, Pedro will speak about the material point methods for numerical modeling, such as deformations. Pedro? Okay, thank you, Yusuf. Let me share my screen. And... Uh... So do you see my screen? Okay, thank you uh, for your kind uh, for your kind words. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be uh, here talking uh, talking to you and sharing some of my some of my uh, my work. And I hope to provoke uh, some uh, new ideas uh, through some of the work that I'm going to be showing. So the title of my presentation is uh, Numerical Modeling of Large Deformation Problems in Geotechnical Engineering, to which I added the uh, topics of challenges and opportunities using the material point method. So before going uh, into uh, diving into it, let me just uh, acknowledge my collaborators, Peter McKenzie, Helva, and Greg Miller, Mike Mosley and Mark Everhart, faculty at UW, and an army of uh, PhD students uh, who really do all the work. And of course, the sponsors in particular, the National Science Foundation and Nery Sim Center and the Science Aid. So large deformation problems are really pervasive in geotechnical engineering and manifest in various forms that include liquefaction induced lateral spreading, flow slides, tailing dams failures, and debris flows, among many others, here a small drawing or a small picture of a flow failure in South Africa, the landslide in La Conchita in 2005, the effect of lateral spreading on the unseating of a bridge decks after earthquake, very common, and here the uh, collapse of the Edenville Dam in 2020, 
uh, that it was attributed to static liquefaction in further studies. So from here, I would like to post a series of questions. The first one is, from a practical perspective, what factors influence our ability to predict the behavior of soils? And I think to answer this, I would like to mention first, we are dealing with a very complex material response where there is a lot of micro to macro dependence that comes from the fact that we are dealing with a porous material. There is a lot of fluid and solid behavior and coexistence. The material behaves as fluid or behaves as a solid and actually coexist the fluid and the solids all the time. There is mixing and separation and there are large deformations in really associated with the problems that we deal with. Associated with that, there are very large scales. We have very complex boundary conditions really dictated by topography and we have to interact with the structural elements. In general, I connect the first set of problems to constitutive behavior, and I try to associate the second set with the numerical model or method that we are using to uh, address uh, this. So if we go first to the constitutive behavior, I want to have a couple of slides, I post another question. Is soil constitutive model in geotechnical engineering a resolved matter? What has been the real progress in the last 15 years? Have we better models that predict better or we have models that predict the same? So immediate answer to this or the immediate comment is please, not another constitutive uh, model. So, but I have to address a little bit this because several problems are associated with the constitutive model. So to that end, I have to say that today, most of the models are based on a continuum uh, formulations. These are well established, they are complex, they require many parameters in general because we want to model very different type of behaviors. And in general, if we want to address the post-peak failure, in general, we need large deformation theories. We also have DN-based models that are very useful in order to understand the micro-macro response, but in general, they are very computationally expensive. Nowadays, we also have what are called the AI ML surrogate constituted models that provide nonlinear mapping functions between these evolving material properties that are nonlinear and the expected material response. They are usually computationally very inexpensive, very good, but they require training, careful. This requires curated databases that are not only experimental, but also numerical databases that can be used for the training of, of, of these elements. So going a little bit more deep into this, let's look at the formulations for these constituting models. Many of them have, can be used in particular, I can mention the multi-yield formulation, bounding surface formulations, generalized plasticity, hyperplasticity, among others. With these formulations in general, I think that we can handle pretty well the contractive and dilated behavior of soils, usually using the state parameters. Critical state behavior is also handled pretty well. And recently we can handle even better the fabric changes using a fabric tensor. Now, it's not enough the formulation. In addition to the formulation, you need the implementation. And to that level, we have explicit implementations that are usually easier, but usually result in very poor convergence and require very, very small strain steps. We can go to implicit formulations that are more permissive in terms of the strain step, but they usually have very ill condition, what they call Jacobians, and they also have problems with the convergence. And on top of that, we have to add large deformation uh, frameworks. It's not enough with the formulation and the implementation. We need calibration. And for calibration, we need to do comparison with experimental results, but also we have to reproduce well-established correlations based usually on field evidence. I wanna mention just a couple of things about the calibration. That requires experimental work using either conventional tests or more novel tests from which we have response under cyclic conditions, under different loading path, could be monotonic or cyclic, that help calibrate our constitutive models. 
So that's all I want to say about constitutive models. This is not a talk about constitutive modeling. So let's go to the other part, the numerical methods that where these constitutive models actually live. And we have several choices at, the, at this level. We can use either finite elements, very good theoretical basis. They have proven to be very efficient in capturing the solid fluid behavior, actually. But they suffer from mesh distortion. And with, when we have large deformations, this is a problem. We can also use finite differences or the finite volume or depth average methods that usually come from the fluids world. And they can be used to solve very problems associated with debris flows, for example. Very good theoretical basis for these methods too. And then we have the mesh te techniques among um, MPM, SPH, PFEM, XFEM, EFG. I will mention this later that can help model large deformations and also capture transition from fluid to solid, uh, solid behavior. So now it's important to understand that any of these methods provide methods, numerical, to solve governing equations. These governing equations are differential equations that define the problem. So the first thing is to understand our problem. And our problem is usually a porous material. And in general, when we define the governing equations, we smear the porous type of uh, context to a smear one where we have volumes that represent representative spaces where we have the particles and the voids and the fluids inside the voids. So what we are really solving is a smear problem. Now, this allows us to look at the governing equations. And these are the only equations that I will show. In general, the governing equations for our problem are the balance of mass and the balance of linear momentum for each phase, fluid or solid, but also the balance of mass and linear momentum for the complete mixture. This is what we have to solve with our uh, finite element or any other numerical model. So we have been able to develop uh, finite elements over the years. They are very advanced. Usually they are very efficient. We look at efficiency. And it's very important to pay attention to these formulations, because if we don't do that, for example, for this case, which is a footing that is loaded on a saturated soil, we may have pore pressures that are not representative of what is happening. So we have to stabilize these uh, finite elements so that we obtain a good uh, response. Now, with them, we have been able to solve problems, for example, this one-dimensional side response, where I am showing the uh, response of the pore water pressure in colors. When the pore water pressure ratio gets to one, red, we have very large deformation. We are using large constitutive models that can handle this problem. Now, the beauty of what we have reached so far is that now we are at a level that if we start comparing results obtained from different tools like Plaxis, like a FLAC, like OpenSeas, we are getting the same type of response, which is validating the type of method that we are using so that we can use this uh, in practice. Now, is this is not only in one dimensions, we can also do two dimensional, three dimensional analysis. This is the case for a bridge abutment, the embankment uh, for the Matakito River Bridge in Chile. The other one is a Yacolem Bridge also in Chile. So we can do 3D finite element formulations in order to handle these uh, problems. So the question is, oh, we are done. So new question, is it enough with the current FEM tools and advances in constitutive models? What about the large deformation problems that I was showing for the Eden Bill case, for example? Can we handle this with finite elements? And the answer is no. So any progress in the last couple of years, and yes, we can do adaptive remeshing in finite elements. We can use the particle finite element method, PFEM, or extended FEM or element-free Gallerkin, material point method, MPM, or smooth particle hydrodynamics. They all handle the large deformation problems pretty well, and I will concentrate on the material point uh, method. So I want to give you just a graphical representation of this method. So in the MPM, the domain is represented by nodes and grids, but the bodies are represented by particles. 
So these particles are not particles of soil. They are particles that carry information that allow us to represent the body. The more particles we do, we have, the better we can represent the geometry and the characteristics of the body. Now, the governing equations that are, we are trying to solve with the numerical method are solved at the nodes, not at the body particles. However, the constitutive behavior is handled within the particles. Constitutive in the particles, solution of the differential equations at the nodes. So there is a lot of data transfer that is required, and this makes the method super expensive. So in a nutshell, we uh, move the stresses to the nodes, then they transform them into forces. We solve the differential equation at this level. We get updates of increments of velocity. With the increments of velocity here, we transfer them back to the particles so that they become increments of strain. With the increments of strains, we have now uh, new stresses. And we also use the changes in velocities to update the location of the particles. So, and then we repeat the process many times. So I don't know if you noticed, but we are using a grid, we are using particles. So MPM is a closely related method to the finite element. So what works with finite elements works with MPM. So it can be seen as a finite element method with a moving, a moving, Gauss, a moving Gauss points. So we implemented this. It's not that difficult to implement. So this is the response of a beam. So you see here the grid nodes that are affected. The particles are not seen because you have many particles to represent the body. You see the normal stresses. So it, it works pretty well for the beam. So what about if we introduce now a constitutive model for soil, more Coulomb? So now you can see the collapse of uh, this bucket of soil and you see the reaction forces. Notice the, the amount of deformations that you are getting here. So now, if you start using the correct constitutive model here, now you can look at the collapse of a little soil column, and you can look at the plastic strains. You can look at the formation of the shear bands. You can start comparing also with experiments. So now, the problem with this is we are done. We discover the method that will solve our problems. So what are the challenges? in advancing this effort or this method? Well, I was showing you just a single phase uh, example of a soil column that is dry. And also it was very small. It was a little soil column. So we need robust couple MPM formulations so that we can incorporate the fluids and have mixing and separation. And we also need something that is efficient and scalable, something that can be brought to the scales of real problems that we are analyzing with a sufficient uh, accuracy. So here I want to bring a couple of slides that I borrow from Alba Gerro. So she has been working a lot on this couple MPM formulations. She started with as just a single phase. And then she said, well, in the same particle, I will introduce fluids either just the water or the water and the air. So each particle carries all that information. And you see that there is a ton of work that has been done on this field by their group. And she has also been looking at using different particles for the fluid and for the solid. And again, a ton of uh, work that has been done uh, at that level. Just one little example from what she did. So this is a 1989 slope that was brought experimentally to failure by a pore pressure recharge. So the idea was to investigate the nature of the progressive failure in over-consolidated uh, clays. For that, they had to deal very well with the boundary conditions, in particular the lateral boundaries, and they did, and they did that. Now, the interesting thing is what they, when they were recharging a, a, a layer here using um, wells, they observed after 196 days that they had the complete collapse of this. So they handled or they reached the problem that they were trying to analyze. So this is kind of a schematic of the problem, two to one slope, weathered gold clay on top, and weathered uh, gold clay uh, at, uh, at the bottom. They had these recharged wells, 20 in total wells. And uh, of course, this is a recharge zone that they were targeting because they knew that the the failure would be somewhere uh, somewhere there. This is a plan view. 
that shows in light blue the location of the recharged wells. They also look at all the other instrumentation that they have in clinometers and so forth. This is the model, NPM, coupled, coupled here. The recharge was a model using the increase in pore pressures. They use a strain softening more Coulomb method, and they have other properties indicated there. And of course, as they increase the pore pressure, at some point, boom, they had the collapse. So when they were looking at the collapse, they say, well, uh, first, the failure progressed from the toe and the crest towards the center. And what they observe is that by looking at the numerical results at locations A, B, C, and D, they were obtaining, yes, a big collapse of this failure. And more importantly, when they were look, comparing to experimental results, here the dots represents experimental results from the field measurements in terms of movements based on location. And you see that the finite elements, the not finite elements, the MPM simulations uh, were, uh, were correct. They were using a tool, I believe, that is called Anura 3D in order to do these uh, simulations. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but it's kind of rough, the model. The model is not super, super accurate in its definition. And the reason for that is because conventional MPM is very expensive. So what can we do? So first of all, we need to go to a more modern MPM that is parallelizable. That's the first thing. Second thing, we have to go from single CPU to maybe multiple CPU or multi-GPU. And second, why, we do why don't we explore what our other fields do and go from graphics uh, to engineering? So the first thing, modern MPM. So I don't know if you remember from my previous slide, I mentioned that there is a lot of data transfers. In the, in the standard MPM, particle to grid and grid to particle that repeat billions of times. So there are new and improved MPMs that facilitate that, in particular, the moving least square quadratic big spline method. There is also the uh, peak flip velocity update mixing, position escape AS flip, affinity velocity AP. So there is a ton of new methods that in general, are coming from the video game, from the video game industry. Not only, but in general, they come from there. So that's the first thing. The second is let's go from single CPU to a uh, multi CPU, and also from a single CPU to multiple uh, GPU. So for the first one, I want to mention the work that is done at Austin by uh, Krishna Kumar. He has a code that is called CVGO MPM that really addresses engineering problems. That's the beauty of that code. It uses multiple CPU, and he gets around an order of magnitude of speed in his analysis. And I want to mention also what is called the UW. UW is University of Washington Claymore MPM that comes from the graphics world and uses multiple GPU and gets a little bit uh, faster, uh, faster, faster speed. Going to the first one, CV Geo MPM. Um, I will show some results that I borrow from Krishna Kumar, where he did an analysis for the Oslo landslide in Washington a couple of years ago. He used 7 million particles, but he had to use around 10,000 uh, nodes that he had access uh, from TAC using a machine that is called Stampede2. Uh, One interesting thing about his code is this plot that shows the scalability, number of codes, cores, sorry, as he uh, increases the number of codes, the runtime goes down and almost linearly. This is very good to obtain a linear scale in his code that shows that his code is properly uh, programmed. So he did analysis of the Oslo landslide. The characteristic of the Oslo landslide that is different than what I was showing before is the area, 2.6 kilometers square. Now, this was a big problem because uh, there were 46 casualties in this case and completely destroyed uh, a town. Now, look at the dimensions. Almost two kilometers, 2.6 kilometers in the other direction, almost 500 meters. So this is a large scale problem. So this is the model that they developed using 7 million particles. This is the run out after 10 seconds. 
This is the run out after 50 seconds. And this is just a simulation that, or a video that shows the simulation. They were very interested in the uh, run out. So as you see now, we are dealing with much larger problems. We have to use a lot of cores in very expensive machines, um, but we can do much better than what we have been doing in the past, going beyond what is the standard MPM. So now I wanna go into multi GPU and GPU. So for that, I wanna explain in a few slides, what is GPU? Is uh, one of these words that today is all over the place when we talk about AI and ML uh, 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 language models. So imagine that this is your host, your computer, you have your processor, you have your memory, you have your input output, a hard drive where you have the information. And nowadays you have these monster graphic cards. That's the device. The graphic card is called the GPU. And what you do in order to obtain very uh, fast videos, is to transfer a lot of information from the host to the device back and forth. So now let's try to represent the same figure now for NPM. So in NPM in your host, you also have input files, input output, that is used to create particles at the CPU level and also the grid at the CPU level. That's the host. Now, when you go to the device, the device has a global memory. It's pretty good memory in general. So you have to transfer the particles and the grid to that memory. And here comes one of the problems. You have to change a little bit the structure of these particles and grids so that they become blocks. And from these blocks, what you do is to transfer these blocks that are in the global memory to a shared memory that are next, that is next to each one of the processors in the GPU. Now, this memory share is very small, nothing compared to the global. And you have to transfer that there. And here is where you perform the MPM simulation. Every time step, you have to do this process. So here is the trick you have to do this properly. If you don't do this properly, your GPU is going to be less efficient than any other code that you have. So you need an optimized GPU scheme for NPM. And unfortunately, these cars are developed almost by a sole developer, NVIDIA. It's not the only one. AMD and other companies also have, but this is the most common. And they have a language that they develop is called CUDA, so that you can interact with the GPU so that you can perform all these, uh, all these activities. So it is worth going into this, this problem. So let me show you two slides. So this first one coming from NVIDIA, I took that from the NVIDIA side, goes to 2008 to 2014 and shows speed and memory in GPUs compared to CPUs in blue. So notice that at the end of 2014, we were able to do three teraflops, teraflops, sorry, teraflops in, in performance, and we had 500 uh, gigabits per second. That's the transmission that, that you can have. So notice that it's growing much faster GPU than uh, CPU. 2014, if you go to the video from the last NVIDIA uh, meeting that they had, now they are talking about the Blackwell GPU. Now we are talking in 2024. Let's go to 2022. We were able to do 4,000 teraflops. We were doing three teraflops in 2014, 4,000 in 2022. And this year we are doing 20,000 teraflops. We are talking about speed. We are talking about velocity and the, and the memory is also growing a lot. So this is what makes it worth the problem of trying to address how to deal MPM in a GPU. Now, this is not easy because we have a limited amount of time for working in this. And if we split our time in a pizza, Italian pizza, you will notice that a lot of time goes into the material models, the partitions, the input and output, the revalidation, the verification. But you have to add all the time now that is required for 
CUDA design, data structures, and so forth. And you will notice that in this piece, uh, most of the time goes into CUDA design, data structures, and so forth. So that leaves a very small time for the really important things for us geotech. So the question is how to transform that so that most of the time is in the parts that we are interested in and little goes into the data structures, CUDA, and so forth. So how to reduce the time that is spent into this uh, CUDA uh, programming and uh, data structures? So here is where we can leverage from computer graphics. Why? Because Disney and Pixar and any other of these companies, they write excellent CUDA. Second, we can leverage from that expertise because they are usually very open to work with us. Open source is a net natural for, for, this, for this group. So the goal was to retool a software that is called Claymore that they develop and to transform into a UDAV Claymore tool that uh, addresses the problems that we are handling, which are geotechnical problems. Now, that's not easy. Because animators care about how things look. We care about how things behave. So notice these two cases are NPM simulations, and both show the correct type of response. The looks are good. But if you look at the pressures in the first one, you see this checkerboarding that shows tension, tension in the fluid that is moving down this bucket. This is completely wrong. And in order to make it look and behave well, you need to add a lot of functionality so that the analysis that you're doing with these tools work well. And that's what we did. And with that, we were able to go from our regular NPM, where we were analyzing 100,000 particles in a 24 hour stretch. That was the time it took to the analysis to model now using UDAW Clay more 1 million particles in 40 minutes. So I can run 24 of these analyses that are 10 times larger in uh, using this, this, this idea. This is used. And now you can start doing nice things. For example, let's look at the wave propagation of impacting bars. Uh, so you can see the reactions. Each bar has a different elastic modulus. You can look at different shapes. And you say, well, where are the particles? Well, there are so many particles that it looks like a continuum. So you see different shapes, also how the, uh, the waves propagate. Now let's look at spheres that are acting by imposing the self-weight, and you see the propagation of the waves up and down. And now you can start looking at experiments for these cases. Each one of these balls is made of many MPM particles. So now we can have many of these little balls, and now you can represent a granular material, and maybe you can start looking at things like the formation of these force change chains that are so common and we know that, uh, that they know that exist. In particular, we were looking at different, uh, the problem of debris. So different debris interacting with a structure and we were looking at the forces induced by these moving pieces of debris. We were looking at number of debris, but also we were looking at different, <laughs> at different materials of the debris. And I will show you a couple of slides <clears throat> that we developed for a problem where the debris were moved by waves generated by tsunamis. So <clears throat> we were modeling, modeling flumes where debris were uh, placed. Now, the flume is around 100 meters, so I call that a medium scale problem. It's not a tsunami problem, which is usually kilometers. But at least we are modeling 100 meet, meters. This is the orange Oregon State flume. So this is a side view of the flume. We had wave gauges located at different locations. We analyzed first just the water, no pieces of debris. We were using 500 million particles for this, for a resolution of five centimeters in a flume that is 100, 120 meters uh, long. So here you see the wave that is generated. There is a box here where we are looking at the force. It's very small in this drawing, but you are going to see that there are some forces that uh, 
generate there. So this is a side view. Here I am showing two cases with two different bulk modules that we use in order to look at efficiencies in time. You see the way that is forming and it's going to be uh, impacting in the structure. This is a close view of the same um, of the same problem, and you will see the way it coming. The light, the colors represent pressures. And you will see here how the waves impact, again, with two different bulk modules. So these are drawings. So we have to look at, for example, wave gauges. Do you get the elevations in the wave gauges? Do you get the forces? We have all instrumented. These are experimental results for the wave gauges. And these are our simulations. Not perfect, particularly after the first peak, we see some reflections here that uh, we have to understand, but the first peak is pretty well captured. What about the forces? These are the experimental forces in that, uh, in that box. These are our simulations. We are not doing that bad. We added pieces of debris to the problem. So pieces of debris, now it shows the piece of debris that is uh, coming. If you remove the water, just for the graphical purpose, I remove the water and you can see the pieces of debris that are interacting. And you can see now that uh, you can look at the forces. And so we did a lot of experiments, 20, uh, 40 experiments in 2020, 300 experiments in 2022. And then we started to compare with uh, our simulation. We did 50 trials at that time. And here I look at the first peak force obtained from the experiment compared to the first peak of the force uh, from the simulation. And as you see, we are not bad. We are really capturing the response in the numerical, in the numerical simulation. So this is water. What about for soils? So this is uh, 2008 a USGS plume. And these are our simulation of the plume. So the plume was 90 meters in length. You can see the experiments versus the simulation. The width is two meters and the height of the material was around 1.2 uh, meters. So they were interested in the run out. This is the run out at different times and also the thickness of the run out. So here I have the thickness that was obtained from our simulations compared to the run out here, velocity. Black means zero velocity. So it goes to a complete, a, a complete stop. So that's where we are right now in the analysis. We can handle uh, simulations for models that are 100 meters or even more with the level of accuracy that is required for engineering. So that's not the only thing. Now we can also mix with other methods like peridynamics. So peridynamics allows us to uh, model, uh, for example, the breakout of walls. So peridynamics is a special method, very similar to MPM, but now we can look at damage in a structure, which is actually the final uh, interest in many of uh, these applications. So I am ending here. So let me go back here. This is original Claymore. So <clears throat> look at this simulation. We have water, you have a soil, they have a constituting model, <clears throat> and you have the collapse of, of the material. This is what the graphical people <clears throat> can do for a dam that is presented here. So we did the same analysis, and I called the great Steve Kramer in order to help me. So this is what I can do today. And of course, when you see this, uh, I can model now the collapse, uh, even Steve Kramer collapses here. So, but the interesting thing is how different is one to the other. So don't be uh, confused. The first one is a video that has a lot of post-processing so that you can see this. The second one is a simulation that includes all the physical quantities that are required. So, it takes also judgment and expertise to understand if our simulations are correct or not. And despite many challenges, the abundant opportunities make this endeavor really worthwhile. So I have a couple of concluding remarks. First of all, I think that the current state of the art in numerical analysis is uh, in geotechnical engineering indicate that the soil response can be properly captured using advanced constitutive models and finite element tools. Large deformation problems in geotechnical engineering can be assessed using also advanced tools like MPM. This is only one of the possible methods that you can use. Challenges. 
the multi-phases, multi-physics problem is still a challenge in all this. And also handling multiple scales, discretization and simulation time presents a challenges. So in here we need access to HPC services, either attack, Amazon Web Services, the access machines, but they require resources. That means money and training. This doesn't happen from one day to the next. So that means education and new curriculum. But the opportunities are important. So pay attention and leverage advances in other fields like we did for the graphics in computer science. And please, always, validation and verification. I repeat, validation and verification. I repeat, validation and, re validation and verification using physical experiments and case histories. I am open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro, uh, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, you really shared with us a just tremendous amount of work. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, so let me start. Uh, MPM is very similar to FEM. So a couple of more calculations should not make the method that expensive. Is MPM computationally expensive only due to data exchange between material points and nodes of the grid? Or are there other factors? I would say that uh, the largest expense is due to the transfer of information from the particles to the nodes and backward in a proper way. And that's the biggest problem, that when you transfer data from one point to another one, you lose things. Either you are dumping or you smear response. And that's the biggest problem. For example, if you try to model contact and you have two of these bodies in the same cell. So mm -hmm. then the nodes, they don't know that there are two cells. They only know what you transfer from the bodies and that can create uh, problems. So I believe that it is the transfer, but not only because of the transfer, it's because of what you lose in the transfer and how to mitigate that. So it's not so easy. It's, it's not so easy. Uh, you have to conserve energy. Uh, you have to conserve mass. Uh, if you use multiple particles to represent solid and fluid, you have to add what is called a volume constraint. Because if you have a bucket full of water and you now introduce a, a piece of a brick, for example, a volume of the water by Archimedes has to go out. So, and that's the volume constraint. And it's not so simple to, to have. I see. Um, second question. Uh, can you please discuss how to determine the triggering mechanism or failure plane in large deformation simulations? Um, and there is a second part of this question about validating them in practical applications, sort of the metrics. Maybe we'll start with the first one first, which is oh, yeah. the, the it's triggering somebody, mechanism. It's somebody that knows finite elements. <laughs> <laughs> somebody that understands finite elements there because... Um, no, no, let triggering, triggering of what? For example, the triggering of a failure, for example, of a failure plane. Um, we all know that uh, if you are using finite elements, it's very, it's mesh dependent. If you mm -hmm. have a very coarse mesh, your failure plane is going to be huge too. It's very, it's connected to the mesh. You reduce the size of the mesh and you get, so uh, you have to use uh, theories like Coserat theories and some other approaches to handle to handle the uh, non-local what is called non-local theories in order to handle uh, to handle that. So uh, that's a problem inherent of finite elements, and because NPM is nothing but an extended finite element, if you, if you want, it is is going to suffer from the same problems. So. What do you do? That's why I mentioned peridynamics. Peridynamics mm -hmm. is a particle-based method that is only for developing cracks. It was developed by civil engineers, particularly, in order uh, to develop or handle cracks in concrete. Mm -hmm. And has only been used in, uh, in, in that, uh, as far as I know, but now there, there are a lot of effort to try to, because they use particles, it's very easy to include that in the earth. So that's one thing. Now, what about triggering of liquefaction? 
That's a different topic. That's a complete triggering. It's not the failure, it's triggering the function. So there you have to rely uh, on the constitutive model. Mm -hmm. And don't forget that because uh, we are using a continuum base, NPM you, is also solved in a continuum base. We can use the same constitutive models. Actually, you take it from one shelf in your in the shelf that I have here, and I put it in the NPM shelf. And it works. And if you have a very good constitutive model that handles the triggering uh, correctly, then it's going to work also here. I see. Uh, so the, if we can go uh, to the second part of the question, which is uh, insights on how you might validate this to some practical problems. I mean, you've shown us a, a few practical problems um, in your examples. Uh, but can you give us a little bit more insights on this? Yeah, that, that's why I wanted to I wanted to show the work by Alba Gerro because it's, it's, it's super valid that um, she, you know you have to be brave in order to handle a problem uh, that is coupled and mm -hmm. you have uh, and your and your test analysis is a real test that is done in a slope. So that's why I include it, so that you see that this is a scale that is not just a little experiment, it's a large experiment. And uh, so I think that we need more of these, more of these uh, validation cases that, um, at, at, at different scales. And don't forget the one as small scales also, because the one as small scales provide a certain level of information, the ones at a larger scale. We have a ton of, not a ton, but we have case histories. And, uh, and nowadays we have so much data in the terms of images that I, 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 we, it's not only a question of time where we are doing inverse analysis uh, inverse analysis uh, in, a, in a way that is credible. So that we say, yes, the inverse analysis is a typical thing that we do in a, in a, in a company, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a private company, inverse, so that we can understand the properties here or there. We are not there yet, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's coming. And to that end, the other thing is to do a lot of parametric analysis. Uh, many simulations of very large problems. So um, changing topography, changing material properties, using uncertainty in the, in the uncertainty, the, in the spatially, and also the inherent uncertainty. So you say, well, well, how long it takes, 24 hours for an analysis, how long it takes to develop a model? So do you need the, the largest GPU that the NVIDIA guy was showing the other day? So I think there is also a lot of work in what I call the improvements of NPM, and not only NPM, where we develop now what is called graph theory, for example. So with graph theory, now you can develop a graph of your problem. Mm -hmm. And if you have the graph of your problem, that graph is a representation of the model and runs super fast much faster than what I am doing with this UW Claymore. It has to be developed with the UW Claymore, the graph. But once you have the graph, you can start doing a lot of... So we are going to see parametric analysis coming along using these graph methods that is something new, something different. It's something where AI makes now sense. AI, we use a lot of AI for inverse analysis, but we haven't been using this for the right type of things. I have the feeling that we are going to see a lot in the in the future. I just want to mention because I have seen the work by Krishna. Krishna Kumar at Austin is uh, uh, is, is fantastic. Yes, I've actually visited with Krishna, and he's doing some really cool work. Uh, let, let me go on to the next uh, question. Um, can NPM capture strain hardening behavior similar to what waste fills might exhibit? Yeah, uh, hard, uh, hardening behavior, yeah, uh, uh, um, because it's a constitutive model. Uh, I think similar to what who? Uh, similar to what uh, you say, hardening, similar to? Uh, not similar to, to represent waste films. To represent wasted? Waste film. Oh, waste film, <laughs> Land, landfill. <laughs> you mean love it? Well, Let's go back to the, yeah, but let's go back to your representative elementary volume. 
Uh -huh. don't, don't forget that we are solving a continuum. Yeah. We are not solving a discrete. Uh, so when you solve a continuum, each one of your if each one of your particles represent everything that you. Have. So if you have refrigerators and you have uh, cars inside your landfill, you have to include that. So that creates a big problem: the scale of your representative elementary volume. Now, if the landfill is with materials that are more. Uh, typical and small size. Absolutely, if you have a good constitutive model for your landfill, and that's the problem, the constitutive model, because chemistry plays a role in constitutive models for, uh, for, for landfills, and mm. that's gonna be the limitation. The limitation is your constitutive model, but yes. And large deformations, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it's, gonna, it's perfect for that. So it could be a topic for a new PhD thesis, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and people that do landfill analysis, I think that this method is, uh, is, is appropriate. If the large deformation problem is like the run out, uh -huh. if, if it is something of importance. Absolutely. So the, the question now is our colleagues, friends in practice. And this is a question that uh, per is very pertinent to them. As a geotechnical engineer, it is challenging to propose the use of the MPM to clients due to substantial time investment required, extensive data collection from the field and from the lab and the whole cost benefit analysis. It might be more reasonable to go with a traditional and simpler methods and adding an additional layer of conservatism to account for their inaccuracies. However, my professional intuition, that's the questioner, as it tells me that this is not the best practice. Any thoughts about it? Sort of basically, how do we move things like MPM from our sort of research experimental domain to, a, to engineering applications? You know, um... Even though that I am in, acad in academia and I have spent all my time in academia, I do some consulting. I do some consulting work on the side, and uh, what is very interesting is to see my clothes. The clothes that I use when I put my consulting <laughs> are very different. <laughs> are very different than the clothes I use as an academician. And uh, men that I am conservative, and because uh, because the implications of uh, making er errors uh, are, are so large that in general, um, so my, my recommendation is always use all your methods. So always all use this always the back of, of the envelope. The back of the envelope is the guide. Is your guide to see what you are getting. And then you explore other methods. In particular, for example, when you're looking at runouts. So all you know, and, and the more you work on this, is that you understand that these uh, runout methods are very empirical. Mm -hmm. uh, they are all wrong. Uh, maybe the person that works in that particular location understands the runout because he or she has lived there for 50 years. So they know what's happening. So you, they don't need an equation that is physics-based. An empirical one is enough. So, but if you don't, I think that these methods uh, play a role. And mm -hmm. uh, what I think is going to happen in the same way that finite elements were uh, when I uh, when I was a kid, and and they were using finite elements, and they were just tools that were not used in practice. Look today, everybody uses flag or plaxis or everybody. Now, do they believe the results in flag and uh, plaxis? And in general, the answer is mm, no, not totally, but, but they help me understand the problem. Mm -hmm. And I have the feeling that the same is going to happen with these models that allow large deformations. They are going to provide a tool that, yes, it's going to require uh, resources in terms of GPUs, but look at the speed of the GPU. It's unbelievable. It's something that you, can, you cannot stop. And it's not driven by the geotext, by the way. <laughs> it's not driven by NPM. But better, better is driven by all these other needs, uh, large language models and so forth. And uh, take advantage of that. And I have the feeling that in a few years, we are going to have these codes uh, mixed with finite elements. Eh? And actually, like five years ago, 
uh, I don't I don't want to uh, advertise for Plaxis, <laughs> but Plaxis had a module of NPM that they were trying to bring together with the finite element, and I thought that they were very uh, um, proactive in the in now of course it, 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 I don't think that anybody uses that, but I had the feeling that something like this is going to be seen in the future in, in all our tools. OpenSys OpenSys has PFM. So Mike Scott uh, from Oregon State, he included, he wanted to include water so that he can do fluid structure interaction. So he added a PFM, a lot of problems, eh? a lot of problems on the way, but I think that they have been solving that. I haven't been following the progress on that, but um, yes, it's gonna happen. So I guess it's an issue of technology, development, software, hardware, and the things that we're currently using were we didn't think about them a few years back, or we thought it was not possible. Yeah. Let me go to a question, a more of kind of a nuts and bolts question for you. Uh, are your MPM uh, simulations are using double or single precision in W Claymore? And what's the performance difference between these? And, and that is really relevant also when you go to GPUs. Uh, absolutely. Good question. Because everybody, when they show you these, um, these, um, these images of the exponential speed, is always single precision. Mm -hmm. So single precision is not enough. Uh, now, uh, so what you have to do is to use two single precision so that you have a double precision. So there are, there are uh, ways to handle the double precision. And what happens when you do that? So when you do that, now the efficiency of the GPU boom, goes down dramatically. So that was until 2000, I would say 20. So in the last couple of years, the new GPU, and in particular, the Blackwell GPU is all double precision. So the problem is gone. So unbelievable. So, and the speed now, because we were doing simulations using this trick of mixing single precision so that you get double. Now we don't need to do that. And the speed went up, uh, went up uh, uh, dram dramatically. So it's, um, now the other thing that I think is interesting in the GPUs is this mm -hmm. need for CUDA. So CUDA is a problem because whoever, if you go into the CUDA code, you wish you had never opened the file because it's difficult. It's difficult. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, reasonable. So, so now they are developing what I call uh, not so low level coding, but a high level coding so that you can interact with your uh, GPU without the CUDA and using more C++, using more uh, Python, maybe Fortran, even Fortran is still available. So you see like uh, uh, scripting languages like Tai Chi. Tai Chi has the name of uh, martial arts. It's not that. It's an incredible data structure package that runs in Python that allows you to connect to uh, your GPU and take advantage of data structures. And you know what? One guy already implemented functionality for the moving least square NPM inside Tai Chi. So I had the feeling that uh, in the same way that many years ago we were programming at assembler level for the CPU, now, and now we know nobody does that. So we are going to go in the same direction for uh, GPUs. It's not going to be needed to, but I don't know when it's going to happen. That very important. I, I think it's happening sooner than later. I've actually been listening to a few talks, and we're kind of also yeah. playing in that space. We're finding that the attempts at having compilers that will allow you to compile yeah. directly into CUDA. So I think uh, it's it's coming along faster than yeah. we think, yeah. so, which is exciting, right? Oh, no, it's fantastic. I developed in Tai Chi an NPM code with 50 lines. So 50 lines of code, I had pieces of blocks falling up. Incredible, incredible. Now, careful with the details, because okay. as I mentioned, everything happens in a world. And these warps are where the little transistors, the processors are. It has to be efficient. If it is not efficient, your GPU is going to be <laughs> is going to be slow. So, anyways, uh, you are right. Uh, this is coming very fast. Okay, I think we have space for one question. Um, 
The field of computer science, machine learning, AI nowadays, is making momentous leaps. And how well do you think we can leverage the pioneering work in this in that field for geotechnical engineering? And how can we broaden our interactions and take advantage of these developments? You know, uh, just to answer, I, I was so surprised by how open the groups of graphics is. They give all the code that they have. By the way, they use physics-based equations. They don't care about what the results are, but they use physics-based. So it's very, so it's very, uh, it's a, it's a group that is very open. So why don't we go to them? There is one guy in particular, uh, Davis. His name is um, Yusef. Uh, oh, uh, oh, oh, I can't forget his name. A blank. Anyways, uh, the uh, Joey Teran. Joey Teran. He worked on Disney with Pixar on Frozen. So, uh, and they were so open. And one thing in computer science, the codes become obsolete in less than one year. Mm -hmm. So they are more than happy to give you everything because it's, ob it's obsolete. And we should leverage from that fact, the geologic time that we use for them is much faster. So take advantage of, uh, go to the computer science, talk to them, and they are really open for, uh, for doing this type of work. So we will only be one year behind them. Pedro, <laughs> I, I want to thank you so much for a very exciting and interesting and thought-provoking uh, seminar. I also want to thank our audience. Uh, again, let me reiterate our the disclaimer we started with. Any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone <laughs> Uh, during this webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, or Medicine. The webinar will be posted online and you will receive information about accessing this recording. With that, I want to thank you and bid you farewell. Thank you very much. Bye.